now, as gunshots echo across the windswept, snow-covered reaches of the wild northwest, Quaker Puff Wheat and Quaker Puff Rice, the breakfast cereal shot from guns, present the challenge of the Yukon. It's Yukon King, swiftest and strongest lead dog of the Northwest, blazing the trail for Sergeant Preston of the Northwest Mounted Police in his relentless pursuit of lawbreakers. One king, one husky. Gold, gold discovered in the Yukon, a stampede to the Klondike in the wild race for riches. Back to the days of the gold rush. With Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice, bringing you the adventures of Sergeant Preston and his wonder dog, Yukon King, as they meet the challenge of the Yukon. (laughs) Say, supposing you were blazing a trail across the windswept, snow-covered Great Northwest. Yes, like Sergeant Preston. Well, sir, you'd appreciate that real stamina calls for a nourishing breakfast. So check up. See to it that your breakfast tomorrow includes a heaping bowlful of Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice with milk or cream and fruit. Remember, wheat or rice shot from guns gives you added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. And delicious? Taste them. You just can't beat Quaker puffed rice and Quaker puffed wheat. Ever since nightfall, two men had been watching the cabin from their hiding place in a thick grove of spruce trees nearby. They remained hidden for about an hour after the light in the cabin was extinguished. Then... When they were sure the occupants were asleep, they crept closer and went silently to work. Small piles of dry brush were stacked around the cabin and splashed with kerosene. Next, the men stuffed kerosene-soaked rags in the cracks of the door. There. I guess that ought to take care of the doorway. Huh, Ringo? Yeah. Now, give me those matches, bud. Yeah, they are right here. I set fire to these rags. Boy, oh boy, look at that stuff burn. Grab yourself one of those pine boughs and light it off the rags. Okay. Now we light all those piles of brush. You take one side of the cabin, I'll take the other. Right. In a few moments, a half dozen or more small fires were blazing around the cabin. The two men threw down their sputtering brands and prepared to flee. All right, bud. Let's get out of here. That seems to be fine. Several minutes later, young Ed Wayne awoke to find the cabin filled with smoke. (coughs) What the dickens it... Holy mackerel. Shirley. Shirley, wake up. What's the matter? The cabin's on fire. On fire? Ed, how did it happen? I don't know. I just woke up and found it this way. Come on, grab your robe. We gotta get out of here. It's so it's choking me. Hold your handkerchief over your nose. I can hardly see. Here, take my hand. Yes, the door's all on fire. Maybe I can open it with a chair. That won't do any good. The door opens inward. I know. Maybe I can lift the latch with the leg of the chair and then poke the leg through the door handle. What's the matter? I can't force the latch. The metal parts must have melted and fused together. What are we going to do? Now, steady, honey. Don't lose your head. Maybe we can get out through one of the windows. Oh, no. It's no use. The windows are blazing, too. That confounded oil paper. I forgot about that. Ed, I... I can't stand the smoke much longer. Here. Lie down on the floor. All right. I... I... Shirley. For heaven's sake, open your eyes. Shirley. Shirley. Preston and King were camped in the hills about a mile from the Wayne's cabin. As the night breeze carried a faint smell of smoke to their camp, King awoke with an uneasy growl. The great dog looked in the direction of the breeze and saw a dull red glow reflected against the sky. Instantly, he sprang up and trotted over to his master. The sergeant was rolled up in his blanket. King nudged his sleeping master and licked his face. Finally, the sergeant stirred sleepily. Oh, what's wrong, fellow? King gave an urgent bark and trotted a few steps in the direction of the fire. 
Sergeant Preston raised up on one elbow to watch the big husky. Then he too saw the reddish glow in the sky. He sprang into action. Wayne's cabin must be on fire, King. We better see if he needs help. Hastily pulling on his boots and tunic, the sergeant saddled his horse. Steady, Blackie. All right, get up there. Come on, Bob. A few minutes later, the sergeant reined up in front of the blazing cabin. Oh, Blackie. Easy. No sign of life, King. Perhaps that Mrs. Wayne are away. But King's nostrils told him that someone was inside the cabin. The great dog dashed forward as close to the flames as he dared and barked excitedly. What is it, King? Someone trapped inside? Help! Help! You're right, boy. That's Ed. Ed, can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. For heaven's sake, get it out of here. Can't you open the door? No, I can't get it open. The latch is huge. I'll break it down. Hurry. We can't last much longer. A number of logs were piled near the cabin. Some of them were slender enough to be lifted. Sergeant Preston picked up one and carried it over to the cabin. There goes, Ed. All right. Go ahead. The door was already weakened by the flames. As the sergeant pounded against it with a log, the door suddenly collapsed inward. Sergeant Preston dropped the log and dashed forward into the blazing inferno. He saw Mrs. Wayne lying on the floor, wrapped in a blanket. Her husband had fallen unconscious beside her. The sergeant picked up Mrs. Wayne and fought his way back to the door. King was hovering just outside the cabin. He saw the beams of the roof give way and sagged downward just over the spot where Ed Wayne was lying. He darted past Sergeant Preston and seized a patch of Ed's clothing in his jaws. He had barely tugged the unconscious man out of the way when a fiery beam fell to the floor beside them. A moment later, Sergeant Preston returned on his second rescue trip. Good boy, King. You pulled him out of the way just in time. I'll take over now. Once again, the sergeant fought his way back to safety. Glad we don't have to go back in there again. I'll lay him down here by his wife. Let's hope we can revive them. The sergeant applied artificial respiration, first to Mrs. Wayne, then to her husband. Both finally regained consciousness. The blanket which Ed Wayne had wrapped around his wife had protected her from the flames, but Ed himself had suffered several severe burns. The sergeant dressed his burns with the first aid materials which he carried in his saddlebag. I'm afraid those places I've bandaged may be pretty painful for a while, Ed. They should heal up without leaving any scars. Yeah, the important thing is that Shirley and I are still alive. Thanks to you and King, Sergeant. How'd the fire ever start, Ed? That's a mystery to me. When we woke up, there were flames shooting out of all four walls. It almost sounds like a case of arson. You mean someone set the cabin on fire deliberately? That's right. I suppose the idea does sound pretty fantastic. Well, it does seem kind of far-fetched. Why should anyone want to set fire to our cabin? You haven't any enemies, have you? Anyone who might want to kill her? Not that I know of. Did you notice any strangers in the vicinity just before dark? No, I don't think... It... Yes, wait a minute. Yes, we did, too. Huh? Well, that's right. Those two men up on the ridge. What were they doing up there? Well, when Shirley first spotted them, they didn't seem to be doing anything, just moving around. Later on, I got out my binoculars and watched them for a while. At that time, they were eating a meal. No campfire? No, they, they were eating their grub coal, I guess. Maybe they didn't want to attract attention. Let's get a good look at them. Good enough to recognize them. You mean you know who they were? Well, I don't know their names, but Shirley and I saw them once before. Where? We saw them riding down Indian Hill once when we were coming back from Pine Creek. That was about a week ago, I guess. What did they look like? They mm -hmm. looked pretty tough, Sergeant. One had a scar under his right eye, and the other had a scraggly red beard. Ed, that description could fit a couple of Dawson hoodlums I know. Their names are Ringo and Spud. They both have criminal records. Goodness. That doesn't sound very reassuring. No, it doesn't. Just to be on the safe side, I think I'll check up on them when I got back to town. But first, let's get you two taken care of. Who's your nearest neighbor? Pop Fraser and his wife, I guess. Oh, they're a good-hearted old couple. You think they'd take you in for a day or so? Oh, I'm sure they would, Sergeant. All right, let's go to their cabin. Then I'll start for Dawson. Early the next morning, Ringo and Spud entered the office of a Dawson City mine broker named Jeff Piggott. Oh, there, Piggott. Oh, so it's you two, huh? Did you take care of that uh, little matter? Yeah, we took care of it all right, didn't we, Spud? We sure did. Kevin was blazing away like tinder when we left. Didn't you wait around to make sure Wayne and his wife didn't escape? Shucks, Jeff. We, we didn't think that was necessary. Besides, we didn't want to take a chance on anyone spotting us. You blasted fools. Would you rather take a chance on swinging for murder? Oh, now keep your shirt on, Piggott. Hasn't come to that yet. What's more, it ain't going to. Now listen. 
In case you two haven't heard the news, the Mounties have found Orford's body up on Indian Hill. They have. When did they find it, Jeff? They found it yesterday afternoon. That means the news will be all over the creeks in another day or two. And if young Wayne and his wife should come forward with information about seeing you two riding down Indian Hill, why, the Mounties would have you in jail for murder so fast it'll make your head swim. Yeah, we know that. That's why we set fire to the cabin. Yes, and that's exactly why I should have made sure they didn't escape. He's right, Ringo. Of course I'm right. Get back there to the cabin as soon as you can. Find out if young Wayne and his wife are dead. If not, kill them some other way. And this time, do the job right. We'll continue our story in just a moment. A bullseye for flavor. Yes, in every spoonful of the ready-to-serve breakfast cereals shot from guns, you enjoy swell, nut-like flavor. A bullseye for crispness. Yes, there's tender melt-in-your-mouth crispness in those king-size kernels of Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. A bullseye for nourishment. Yes, Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice give you added food values of restored natural grain amounts of vitamin B1, niacin, and iron. You're always on the target when you reach for that famous big red and blue package with the smiling Quaker man on the front. Pour out a bowl full of crisp, delicious Quaker puffed wheat or Quaker puffed rice. Add milk or cream, top with your favorite fruit. Man, oh man, these giant flavor-rich premium grains are exploded up to eight times normal size to make them crisp and tender. They're shot from guns to make them bigger and better tasting. Shot through and through with nut-like flavor, too. Buy both delicious kinds. For variety, eat Quaker puffed wheat one time, Quaker puffed rice the next. Just remember, they're never sold in bags or bulk. You can't miss with Quaker puffed wheat and Quaker puffed rice. The famous cereals shot from guns. Now to continue our story. At the same time that the two crooks, Rango and Spud, were talking to the mine broker, Jeff Piggott, Sergeant Preston was reporting to Inspector Maynard at Mounted Police Headquarters. You wanted to see me, Inspector? Uh, yes, Sergeant. I have a new assignment for you. Have you heard about the murder that Constable Ross discovered yesterday? Why, no, I haven't, sir. I just got into Dawson about an hour ago. Who was the victim? A man named Orford. He was shot through the heart at close range. Apparently, he'd been dead for a week or so before Constable Ross found his body. Any clues to the motive? Well, a gold watch and a valuable ring that Orford always wore are missing. So it looks like a case of robbery. Was Orford a rich man? Yes, he was, Sergeant. He was something of a hermit. But he had his finger in several important mining deals. The killer may have expected to find a lot of money on the premises. Where'd Orford live? In a cabin on Indian Hill. Indian Hill? Does that mean something to you, Sergeant? Why, yes, it does, Inspector. Last night, someone tried to kill a young couple named Ed and Shirley Wayne. It seems two strangers were hanging around the vicinity yesterday afternoon. The Waynes told me they saw those same two men riding down Indian Hill about a week ago. A week ago, huh? That would be just about the time the murder took place. That's right, sir. I'm just wondering if those two men might have been trying to kill the Waynes to prevent them from telling what they saw. Did the Waynes give you a description of the two men, Sergeant? Yes, sir, and I think I know who they are. A couple of hoodlums ago by the name of Rango and Spud. Well, Sergeant, suppose you get busy and check up on those men. I'm assigning Constable Ross to work with you on the case. Very well, sir. Jeff Pickett was seated in his office as Sergeant Preston and Constable Ross entered. Well, good morning, Sergeant. You too, Constable. Good morning. Hello. Mighty fine dog you've got there. Mighty fine. I'm afraid he doesn't always like to be petted by strangers. So I see we're looking for Ringo and Spud. Well, I know the men slightly, but why look for them here? The bartender at the Gold Dust Cafe suggested we try your office. He told us that Ringo and Spud frequently do odd jobs for you. I wouldn't exactly say that. It's true, I have employed them once or twice. In what capacity? Well, if you must know, as bodyguards. Bodyguards? That's right. Mining deals sometimes lead to a certain amount of ill feeling. My life has been threatened on several occasions. Oh, I see. Speaking of mining deals, were you acquainted with a man called Orford? Orford. Orford. 
Seems to me I have heard the name, but I can't place it offhand. Don't you read the newspaper? Oh, yes. Yes, of course. Orford's a man who was found murdered over on Indian Hill. I did read something about the case, but it slipped my mind. I hope you don't think I know anything about the murder. Well, since you've raised the question, do you? Certainly not. Can you tell us where to find Rango and Spud? I'm afraid I can't, Sergeant. To tell the truth, I haven't seen them recently. In that case, we'll be moving along. Thanks very much for answering my question. Not at all, Sergeant. Not at all. Goodbye. Goodbye. What do you think, Sergeant? Alex is just a hunch, but I have a feeling he's lying. That business about not knowing Orford's name sounded pretty thin to me. Yes, it did to me, too. And he didn't sound any too convincing when he said he hadn't seen Rango and Spud recently, either. Alex, I think you'd better stick around here and keep an eye on Figgett. It's just possible that Rango and Spud will come to see him, or he may go and see them. Well, what about you? I'm going to ride out to Otter Creek and see Ed Wayne and his wife. Frankly, I'm a little worried about those two. Oh, why so? If Rango and Spud really did kill Orford, then they may make another attempt to do away with the Waynes. I think I'd better warn the Waynes to be on their guard. A good idea. How soon will you be back? Probably not before evening. In the meantime, watch every move that Jeff Piggott makes. It was several hours after Sergeant Preston talked to Jeff Piggott that Rango and Spud arrived at the scene of the fire. The two crooks poked around among the still smoking ruins of the cabin, but failed to find the bodies they were looking for. By thunder, Ringo, there just ain't no bodies here. Young Wayne and his wife must have gotten away. Yeah, it sure looks that way. Yes, me, we better clear out of here. We'll have a lot of explaining to do if anyone catches us poking around the ashes this way. We'll have a lot more explaining to do if young Wayne shoots off his mouth to the police. Well, what are we going to do? We can't kill him if we can't find them. Listen, when a family gets burned out, they generally go and stay with their neighbors, don't they? Yeah, I guess that's so. All right, then. Who's the nearest neighbor the Wayne's got around here? Well, let me see. There's no coot and his wife living over on Otter Creek. And that's where we better go. I'll bet you ten to one we find the Wayne's there. All right, I guess it's worth a try. Come on, let's go. <laughs> get up, get on it. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston had already arrived at Otter Creek. As he approached Pop Frazier's cabin, he saw Ed Wayne just riding away. Shirley Wayne was mounted behind her husband on the same horse. Sergeant Preston spurred his mount forward and shouted to the young couple. Ed, wait a minute. Why, Sergeant Preston? Oh, hold it. Hold it. Hold on, Hold on. Sergeant, what brings you here? Sure didn't expect to see you again so soon. We certainly didn't. We thought you went to Dawson. I did. I just came back to warn you. Warn us? About what? When I got to Dawson this morning, I learned that a man had been murdered up on Indian Hill. It looks as though the two men you saw may have been the ones who killed him. What? If they really are guilty, then they probably set fire to your cabin to keep you from talking. You mean they tried to kill us so we couldn't tell the police we saw them riding down Indian Hill? That's right. When they find out you weren't burned to death, they may make another attempt to kill you. Uh, that doesn't sound so good. Do you think it's safe to go back to our cabin? Is that where you were heading? Yes. Pop Fraser lent us his horse. Oh. We were going back and see if we couldn't salvage something from the ruins. Suppose I go there with you just to be on the safe side. That's a good idea, Sergeant. We'd sure appreciate having you along. All right, let's go. Come on, Blackie. Come on, get up. In order to get to Otter Creek, Rango and Spud had ridden up the hillside and were following a trail along the crest of the ridge. Suddenly, Rango reined up his horse sharply. Oh, 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 oh. oh. What's the matter, Ringo? Take a look down there in the distance. Yeah, I see. Looks like a couple of riders coming up the valley. Still got those binoculars we were using yesterday? Yeah. They're right here in my saddlebag. Let me take a swing, too. Here they are. Thanks. Holy smoke. What do you see? One of them's a red coat. Who's with him? Young Wayne and his wife. She's riding behind him on the same horse. You suppose they've already spilled the beans about seeing us? I don't know. We better not take any chances. What do you mean? We'll dismount right here, hide in that clump of trees. When they come in range, we'll gun them down. All three of them. A light breeze was blowing up the valley. Suddenly, as Sergeant Preston and his two companions drew closer to the point where the two crooks were hidden, King stiffened in his tracks and gave a low growl. Oh, 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 oh. What's the matter with King, Sergeant? He evidently picked up a scent of some kind. Oh, good heavens. You don't suppose those two men could still be hanging around here somewhere, do you? I don't know, Shirley. 
I think we'd better let King scout around a bit before we go any farther. Meanwhile, Rango and Spud had seen the group rein up their horses. Hey, what in thunder are they stopping for? That husky must have caught our scent. We better plug them right now. They're not close enough. We can't get a decent shot at them from here. You fool, we got no choice. Now they're wise to us. They won't budge till that dog routes us out of here. All right, you take young Wayne. I'll plug them out. All right. Here goes. The first shot rolled Ed Wayne from his saddle, his wife falling with him. The sergeant ducked instinctively and dropped to the ground as the second bullet whistled harmlessly over his head. Sergeant, Ed's been hit! Keep down or they'll hit you too. With an angry snarl, King charged in the direction of the shots. Ringo saw the big husky start up the slope and vanish in a thick underbrush. Hey, that dog's coming up here after us. Holy smoke. We'll never be able to stay hidden once he gets up here. Yeah, and what's more, that mount has got a carbine. He'll pick us off like clay pigeons. I'm getting out of here while we're getting as good. You and me both. Stop! Keep down, Ringo. Get on, get on. The two horsemen were already gone by the time King reached their hiding place. Meanwhile, Sergeant Preston got cautiously to his feet. Did you hit them, Sergeant? I doubt it, but at least we've driven them off. Please help me with Ed. His shirt's all soaked with blood. Maybe they've killed him. Oh, let's try his pulse. Still beating. Wait till I rip open his shirt and we'll be able to tell what's what. Oh, looks dreadful. Luckily, it's in the shoulder and not in the chest. Oh. Sergeant Preston sterilized a knife and deftly probed for the bullet. As he was dressing the wound, Ooh. Ed Wayne gradually recovered consciousness. Oh. Sorry if I hurt, Ed. Uh, it's, it's all right. You have an expert touch. I guess you should have been a surgeon. Thank heavens the sergeant and king were with us. Yeah. If it hadn't been for me, you could have chased those gunmen and captured them. Well, don't worry about that. King has a scent. As soon as we get you two back to Pop Fraser's, we're going after those men. Meanwhile, Ringo and Spud were galloping toward Dawson. Darkness had fallen when they finally reined up their horses in front of Jeff Pickett's office. Oh, 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 oh. Jeff! What's that? Oh, so you finally got back, huh? Eh? Listen, Jeff. We're in trouble. Trouble? What do you mean? In the first place, Wayne and his wife ain't dead. What? Didn't you kill them like I told you to? We tried to, but they had a Mountie with them. A Mountie? Yeah. Now, listen, we saw all three of them riding along the trail together. We tried to gun him down, but the Mountie had a dog. He got our scent before they came close enough to get a Hastily, good Ringo told the mine broker about the brief gunfight. So the only thing we could do was to hightail it out of there before the Mountie got a beat on us. You bungling idiots. It wasn't our fault, Jeff. Did the Mountie get a good look at either one of you? Oh, no, I don't think so. But he won't have to once that guy Wayne and his wife spilled the beans about seeing us on Indian Hill. And if he's got any brains at all, he'll figure out right away who'd have reason enough for wanting him dead. Yes, you're right. Listen to me. Have you two still got that watch and ring you stole off Orford after you killed him? Yeah. Yeah, we got them right here, Jeff. Let's have a look at them. Uh -huh. Yeah. Here they are. I see the watch has Orford's initials on the case. Yeah, I guess we'll have to file them off. Just a minute. I'd like to take a closer look at that ring. I have a magnifying glass right here in my desk. Put up your hands, both of you. Hey, what? <laughs> What in blazes are you doing with that gun? I'm pointing it right at you. What's more, I won't hesitate to pull the trigger if either one of you makes a false move. Now keep your hands up high while I take your guns. That's better. Take it, have you gone clear out of your head? Not by a long shot. What's the idea of all this monkey business? This monkey business, as you call it, is going to settle the Orford murder case and put me in the clear once and for all. You can't bluff us, Piggott. You hired us to kill Orford. And by thunder, if you try turning us in, we'll spill the whole story. The only thing you two are going to spill is a few pints of your own blood. Right here and now. Hey, what are you driving at? Just this. I intend to kill you two and then call in the Mounties. What? What do you mean? That's right. I'll tell them you two came here and tried to sell me the valuables you stole from the man you murdered. I'll say I recognized them and got suspicious. When I accused you of murder, one of you pulled a gun on me. But luckily, I got the drop on you and shot the both of you. In self-defense. Hey, listen, don't do it. You'll never get away with it. This gun says I will. And it's ready to talk right now. Yes, again, Pickett. Preston. Me. Sergeant Hold Preston it. stood in the doorway. Behind him was Constable Ross. Stop that gun. All right. 
He shot out the lamp. Find him, King. Oh, Alex, hey. go around and cover the back door from the outside. Hurry. Help! Help! Call him off, Preston. Easy, Help. King. We've got him, boy. Come on, Spud. Yeah. As Spud and Ringo started to go out the back door, they found themselves facing the gun of Constable Ross. All right, reach, both of you. What, the, what about Pickett, Sergeant? King has him under control. Is there any kind of a light back there? There's a lantern hanging just outside the door. Keep those two covered while I light it. A few right. moments later, the Mounties marched their prisoners back into the office. Sergeant Preston held a lighted lantern in one hand. Jeff Pickett lay whining on the floor. For the love of heaven, call out this dog. Take that gun away from you, and I'll tell him to let you up. All right. All right, King, I'll take over now, boy. Get up on your feet, Pickett. All right. Constable Ross and I have been standing outside the door ever since Ringo and Spud entered your office. We overheard the whole story. You're all three under arrest in the name of the Queen. There's just one thing we don't understand, Ringo. What's that? Why did Pickett hire you two to kill Orford? Because he had a chance to buy a valuable claim dirt cheap. And Orford was blocking the deal. That deal would have netted us a cool $100,000. And still those two cheap cutthroats couldn't resist the temptation to steal the dead man's watch and ring. You're no smarter than they are, Pickett. You'll find that out when the judge pronounces sentence and this case is closed. In just a moment, Sergeant Preston will give you a preview of Friday's adventure. Listen next Monday for a wonderful surprise. What is it? It's out of this world. Yes, but what is it? It's a he. Not human, exactly, but you all love him. But who is he? You'll find out on this program. Yes, don't miss out. Get in on hair-raising adventures next Monday by way of the greatest offer ever made to you by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. Be listening. Say, fellas and girls, it's a feather in your cap if you remind your dad and mom that it's community chest fun time. Yes, it's red feather time when everybody benefits because everybody gives. This is a chance to help many, many worthy organizations in this one drive for funds. So give to your community chest now. Listen Friday when Sergeant Preston and Yukon King meet the challenge of the Yukon in the case of the Great Carlotta. When the inspector told me of a murder in Dawson and I set out with King to help solve it, I didn't expect one of my brother officers to make an arrest so quickly especially when the suspect was a young friend of mine. Trying to prove he was not guilty led King and me into a situation that could mean death to either of us. Be sure to hear this exciting adventure Friday. These radio dramas, a feature of the challenge of the Yukon Incorporated, are created and produced by George W. Trendle, directed by Fred Flowerday, and edited by Fran Stryker. The part of Sergeant Preston is played by Paul Sutton. They are brought to you every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at the same time by Quaker Puffed Wheat and Quaker Puffed Rice. The breakfast cereal shot from gun. Remember, for delicious hot breakfast, enjoy Quaker Oats. The giant... Of the cereals is Quaker Oats. Delicious, nutritious, makes you feel ambitious. The giant of the cereals is Quaker Oats. And here's why Quaker Oats is called the giant of the cereals. There's more growth, more endurance in oatmeal than any other whole grain cereal. So make your hot breakfast nourishing Quaker Oats. Quaker and Mother's Oats are the same. This is Jay Michael wishing you goodbye, good luck, and good health from Quaker Puffed Wheat.